Spider-Man's great, but I mean, he's nothing compared to Wonder Woman. Oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I gotta go. I lost track of time. The kids are here for the adventure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'll tell them to visit. Sure. Bye. Well, hello. Welcome to my office. I'm Peyton, and I'm an explorer. What's an explorer? Well, you'll just have to find out. Where are we going today? What do you think? Let me give you a hint. Lots and lots of animals. That's right, we are going to the zoo. I'm so excited. Do you have your explorer tools? What explorer tools? Well, an imagination, a willingness to learn, and lots and lots of questions. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look on the map. Wait, I completely forgot. Do not forget to mask up. We are heading over here today. Ready to go? Mill Mountain Zoo. I'm Bambi Godkin and today I'm going to be talking to you about habitats and adaptations. Now habitats of course are a place where an animal lives and to have a successful habitat it needs to have a few things that all animals, all living things need and one of those is food, of course water, air which thankfully is easy to find, and shelter. So a home, a nest, a cave, something to give that animal shelter. Now, we have here at Mill Mountain Zoo a lot of different habitats that you can view from the top of the mountain. Of course, we are on a mountain, which is a habitat, and there are forested mountains, like our mountains here, but there are also cold, um, wet, snowy mountains. There are arid, dry mountains. So there's different mountains and different types of animals that live in those mountains. Um, you can, of course, see Roanoke down there, and a city is a habitat. Of course, people live there, but there are a lot of animals that have adapted well to living around people in our backyards, in our parks, and things like that. And you can not see it, but the river is down there as well. So the Roanoke River is gonna provide habitat for uh, waterfowl, for fish, and other things. And that kind of brings me back to adaptations. So an adaptation is going to be a physical trait of an animal that makes them well adapted to the habitat that they live in, or a behavioral adaptation, which is something that that animal does to make it successful, whether it's hunting, so you can think of like animals that have claws or sharp teeth, typically those are gonna be carnivores, and those sharp teeth and claws help them catch their prey. Some animals, like certain snakes and spiders, have venom that help them catch their food. And then you have animals that live in cold environments, like polar bears, our, our snow leopard, our red panda, that have nice thick hair to help keep them warm. Uh, fish live in the water. They have gills to help them get the oxygen out of the water. So those are adaptations. So we're gonna look at some of our animals here at the zoo, and we're gonna talk about their habitat features in their exhibit and where they come from in the wild, as well as some adaptations that those animals have to make them well-suited for the environments they come from. Ready? All right. I'm going to introduce you to our tufted deer. His name is Honeycut, and he's actually the second oldest tufted deer in captivity. He's 26 years old. Now, tufted deer are from Southeast China and Burma, and they do very well here at Mill Mountain Zoo, as you can tell by his age, um, because our our elevation similar to some of the elevations that you would find them in in Asia. So these guys live in forested elevations up to 15,000 feet and they browse on a lot of different plants that you would find similar to what would grow here. Um, so he gets a lot of leafy greens and other plant material to eat. The tufted deer is called the tufted deer because of that little tuft of hair that you see on his forehead and that obscures his antlers. He does in fact have antlers. Now, they are sometimes called vampire deer, and that is because they have two elongated canine teeth that look like fangs. 
because they are a small deer species, they do have to watch out for predators. So when they get scared, they will bark. And that is a behavioral adaptation that will alert other tufted deer that there's danger. And they will also flee. They're very fast and they can flee like white-tailed deer do. They bob that white tail up and down as they run away. Um, and that makes it harder for predators to track them as they're fleeing. The next stop on our tour is Nova, our red panda. Red pandas are native to China, Nepal, and Myanmar, and they also live in forests. If you look at her exhibit, you see lots of branches and trees. You're also going to notice bamboo, because these guys are found in bamboo forests at pretty high elevations. Oh, there she is. <laughs> and unlike the giant panda, their diet isn't limited just to bamboo, but it does make up a large portion of their diet, but they also eat roots, acorns, eggs, and other things like that. And here she gets a variety of, uh, you know, fruit, leaf eater biscuits, and then the bamboo, which we grow throughout the zoo. The I know she's curled up sleeping. Um, they are crepuscular, so they are not terribly active during the day. So she gets her food in the morning. She's active while she's eating, and then she gets her food later in the afternoon. And that's when she's active, and she pretty much does that the rest of the day. <laughs> but um, if you were to be able to see, she has a very long tail and very thick fur. So those adaptations are gonna help her stay warm in the cold mountain climates that they live in and the tail doubles also as a blanket so you can kind of see in her little nest box there that she has the tail wrapped around and her face because their tail is about usually the same length as their body and so they're able to wrap it around when it's really cold and use it as a scarf or blanket and then because they do so much climbing in the trees they have that long bushy tail which helps with balance. So when you have animals that have long tails or big bushy tails, that tail usually functions as balance. Um, we use our arms as balance, but animals don't have arms that they can stick out to help balance them when they're moving. These eyes also have an adaptation that they have in common with the giant panda, even though they're not related to the giant panda, they are in their own group. Um, but they have an extended wrist bone that comes out kind of like a thumb. And that extended wrist bone helps them grip and hold on to the branches when they're climbing the trees, but it also helps them grip and hold on to their bamboo stalks when they're eating. So they're really cool animals. <laughs> Our Asian small clawed otters, which are definitely a guest favorite, and the Asian small clawed otter is the smallest of the otter species. So when you see them, you're gonna notice they're a lot smaller than say your North American river otters or sea otters. Um, you're also going to notice that there is a lot of land in the exhibit area and not just water features. So when you see other species of otter at zoos, typically you're just seeing water features and not really any land. But the Asian small clawed otter, in addition to being the smallest otter species, is also more terrestrial than other otter species. So that's why they have a lot of land to romp and play in here as well as their water feature. Um, these guys are found in Southeast Asia and the Philippines and China, and they are going to be found usually in marshes, mangroves, um, rice paddies, any kind of wet area uh, where they're going to be looking for a lot of different shelled animals, so mollusks and things like that, fish, of course, and other things that they're going to find in and near the water. Because they aren't as aquatic as other otters, one adaptation that they have is they don't have fully webbed feet. So you'll see with other otters, fully webbed feet. These guys are just webbed down to the last digit. So they have really good manual dexterity to grip and hold on to things. Um, and they also have extremely strong jaws. Those extremely strong jaws help them crack open shells. So that's one adaptation. But they also have a really cool behavioral adaptation that helps them get at their food. And that is actually putting the shells, like the bivalves, mussels, clams, whatever it is, out in the sun. And then the sun will cook them just like when you steam your oysters and they open up so it makes it easy for them to get at their food. So they're very intelligent little critters. Our next stop here is 
our bald eagle exhibit. Our bald eagle exhibit houses two non-releasable bald eagles, Elsie and Eleanor, and both of them were injured in the wild and had to have part of their wing amputated so they cannot sustain flight and thus cannot hunt for their food as they would need to in the wild. Bald eagles are found throughout the vast majority of North America. You're going to notice that they do have a water feature in their exhibit as well as trees and branches because they would typically live in nests and trees. In fact, nests that can be five or six feet wide and two or three feet deep and they usually have those nests at the top of the trees where they can more easily take flight and also where they can um, see their surroundings very well. Um, they're going to be found near lakes, rivers, streams, the coast, reservoirs, any place where they have good water sources to find fish, which is their primary food in the wild. They do have large claws and feet that you can see are going to help them grip and hold um, and catch the fish that they're going to eat, but they do eat small rodents and other animals as well, and sometimes carrion. The bald eagle has a pretty good success story as far as conservation goes. Um, they were endangered species um, up until 2007, and in the 19, in, around 1980, they banned the use of DDT, which was a pesticide that was commonly used, and it caused their eggs to become brittle. So they could not sit on them without crushing them, and that was really impacting their population. Um, but they've been um, off the list since 2007, so that's really good news for our national bird. The last stop on our tour today is our reptile house where we are going to talk about our Burmese pythons, Damien and Hoover, to a variety of habitats. A lot of the animals that we've looked at today are very specific to where they can live, like red pandas have to live in bamboo forests, bald eagles want to live near water. Um, these guys will do well in mountainous regions, they do love watery environments so swamps and marshes and things like that, but they also will hang out in forested areas. So they have a lot of different places that they can adapt to and live. The tree features, you see smaller Burmese pythons will sometimes hang out in trees, but because of their size, Burmese pythons are one of the largest snakes in the world. Um, there's actually, you know, that's two in there, not just one huge snake, um, but it is not uncommon for these to get 20 feet long, even 25 feet long. And they might weigh as much as 200 pounds. So hanging out in a tree, for this type of python is not as common as it is with your smaller species. Um, but they are very um, well adapted to blending in. You see they have the camouflage, and that's gonna help them blend in on um, forest floor, in the water. And they, because of their size, can eat a lot of different prey items. So they have backward facing fangs that they're gonna grab and hold. This is a type of snake that is what we call a constrictor. So they're very muscular, they're going to wrap around their food and squeeze it until it stops breathing and then they're going to go ahead and swallow it. And because of their size, they can eat a large Burmese python, so one that's like 20, these guys are like 13 feet long, but like one that's like 20 or more feet, they can eat small pigs and small deer. So pretty impressive. Um, but they are going to, they have a sliding hinge, their jaw opens. It doesn't lock their hinge, their way their jaws are hinged, they don't lock like ours do. So they can open their mouth and swallow things three or four times the size of their head. So pretty impressive adaptation right there. Thanks for joining us for the tour today. Um, I hope that you learned some interesting facts about the animals. And I hope you come up and see us and learn some facts about some of the animals that weren't on the tour. Welcome back, explorers. I had such a good time at the zoo learning about the animals and the habitats. Did you have a good time? I especially like seafood, so I really liked learning that the Asian small claw otters can actually cook their own seafood by leaving shells out. Isn't that crazy? Don't forget to write down what you learned in your Explorer Passport this week. And always ask questions. I can't wait to see what we learn next time. Bye, Explorers!